For those of you obsessed with silence, Arctic has a solution. Howdy howdy guys, Ponchato here, and today we're going to take a look at the Alpine AM4 Passive from Arctic. Thanks to Arctic for sending this over for review, and let's get started. The Alpine AM4 was released earlier this year for one specific purpose, completely passive cooling for the AM4 socket. That means no fans, no noise, and the potential for maintenance-free operation since you won't have a fan blowing dust directly at the heatsink. It comes in at a pretty attractive price too only about 13 US dollars. The heatsink is basically just a machined aluminum block with fins cut out, a black anodized surface which Arctic says improves cooling, and it comes with thermal paste pre-applied. It's almost a perfect cube at 99 millimeters wide and long and only 70 millimeters tall. Because it is passive, heat dissipation is limited to a 47 watt TDP. That'll cover the Ryzen 3 2200G, Ryzen 5 2400G, and the new Athlon 200GE. Technically, most processors won't exceed or even reach their rated TDP at stock speeds, so it can handle other low power processors like the Ryzen 3 1200 I'll be testing it with today. The outside of the box shows you all the pertinent info, the Alpine AM4's 6 year warranty, Arctic's comparison with a stock cooler, and the basic specs. Opening up the box, at the top you'll find all the mounting hardware which consists of 4 screws, 4 springs, and 4 washers. Below that, the Alpine AM4 itself. Because it comes with thermal paste pre-applied, it has a plastic protective cover over the bottom to keep dust off. Beyond that, it has two sets of mounting holes so it can be mounted with the fins vertical or horizontal, depending on the airflow in your case. To install it, you first remove the stock AM4 brackets and backplate. The Alpine AM4 doesn't use either of them since it mounts directly to the motherboard. Arctic recommends you install it so the fins are aligned with the airflow in your case. Since mine goes front to back, I'll be mounting it with the fins horizontal. The first thing I did was stick the washers to the back of the motherboard, over the mounting holes. They're slightly adhesive, so they'll stay in place wherever you put them. An Arctic's manual said to first install the heatsink, then install the screws, but I decided to do it backwards so I could have the heatsink lined up perfectly the first time. So I put the springs on the screws and dropped them in the mounting holes. Then I needed to flip it over while holding all four screws in place. With it flipped over and the screws in place, I lined up the heatsink and set it down. It was at this point I realized Arctic had actually said to do it their way because their way works. It's pretty hard to tighten down screws when they're completely covered and upside down. So learning from the error of my ways, I followed their directions. I did my best to line up the patch of thermal paste with the CPU, then set it upside down on the table. You might want to support the motherboard with something so it doesn't fall off the heatsink like this. After getting the mounting holes on the motherboard aligned with the threaded holes on the heatsink, I tightened the screws in a crisscross pattern so it wouldn't bend the motherboard as they get clamped down. With it installed, you can see it's a pretty large chunk of metal but fits very close to the socket. It also sits completely separated from the RAM slot so memory clearance won't be a concern. I'll be testing it with a Ryzen 3 1200 at stock speed and voltage which comes out to 3.1 GHz at about 1 volt while running a stress test with Prime95. Total power draw for the CPU at this speed is right around 50 watts, so slightly over the rated TDP for the cooler. We'll see what happens. The case I'll be running the system in is a Cooler Master Masterbox Lite 3.1, which includes a single 120mm exhaust fan. The Focus Plus 850 power supply was provided by Seasonic, and the GPU is a passively cooled GT1030, so there are no other noise sources for this test setup. At idle and with the exhaust fan stopped, the system is, of course, completely silent. Because the heatsink is such a large thermal mass, it takes quite a while to reach its equilibrium temperature of around 55 degrees Celsius. Of course, that's pretty warm for an idle temperature, but this also isn't anything like a typical cooler. The stress test is where things got interesting. I tested it with the fan off at 50% speed, 75%, and finally 100%. With the processor running fully stock, it hits the 95 degree thermal limit at every exhaust fan speed except for 100%. The nice thing about running it all stock is that the processor will automatically thermal throttle itself at that limit so it doesn't get damaged, whereas if you overclock or specify a certain frequency and voltage, the system will just lock up once it hits that temperature limit. Even with the fan at full speed though, the processor was still sitting at over 92 degrees Celsius. I was curious if having the fan at the front of the case blowing air over the cooler rather than pulling it away would improve the thermal performance, so I repositioned the fan to the front of the case and ran the tests again. It actually made a pretty sizable difference. The temperature at full speed dropped by more than 5 degrees, down to 87 degrees Celsius. And even with the fan at 75% speed, the processor didn't throttle. It was only at 50% that the processor hit that thermal limit of 95 degrees. 
Passive coolers are a bit of a challenge. You give up a significant amount of thermal performance to achieve absolute silence. But for most people, that's actually not a big loss. Most people, very simply, don't use or need that much in the way of performance from their computers. And even for someone who does, the Alpine AM4 could be perfect for a second computer, a home server, or a media center PC, where quiet operation is paramount and the processor will almost never be at full load to begin with. Normal CPU coolers are somewhat dependent on case airflow, but for passive coolers, it's absolutely vital. The best setup for thermal performance would be a case fan on the side panel, blowing air directly onto the passive cooler, but then you're kind of defeating the purpose of having a passive cooler to begin with. The installation procedure for the Alpine AM4 was a bit finicky, mostly because you have to try to line up the patch of thermal paste on the cooler with the CPU. To be completely fair though, it is a really straightforward process and only takes a few minutes, and unless you're switching out coolers every week like I am, you'll probably only have to do it once. The big thing to keep in mind with these tests is that I was using a Ryzen 3 1200 to really push it to its limits. The 1200 is among the first generation of Ryzen processors, which are quite a bit hotter than the second gen. Because of that, the 2200G and 2400G would be a better match for this cooler in the real world. Actually, I think this cooler would be perfect for a home office build with AMD's 2-core 4-thread Athlon 200GE, which has a TDP of only 35 watts. That won't get anywhere near its thermal limit with this cooler. You could very readily make a completely silent office PC if you only utilize SSDs, a semi-passive or completely passive power supply, and a passively cooled graphics card, assuming you don't just use the processor's built-in graphics. And to top it off, the Alpine AM4 is under 15 bucks. That is really, really cheap. If you want to pick one up for yourself, click the link in the description. Hit subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified of new videos as soon as they're up. So guys, if you like this video, hit the like button if you want to see more, hit subscribe, and if you have any questions on the Alpine AM4, leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, I hope I helped, and I'll see you in the next video.